And God said, Behold, I have given you every herb bearing seed. To you it shall be for food. Genesis 129. Man did eat angels' food. He sent them meat to the full. Psalm 78, 25. Everyday Manna with Lisa. Hi, everybody, and welcome to Everyday Manna. Today, we are going to make one of my all-time favorite crock-pot meals, and that is a beef pot roast. To go alongside that, we're gonna have mashed potatoes, but we're gonna jazz them up just a little bit. And we are gonna have for dessert something that I thought, you know, it's not a cake, it's not a crumble, it's not a crisp, it's kind of a combination of all those things. So it's a fruit cramble. And that's where we're gonna start. You're gonna need a dish about this size, like a nine by 13, eight by 12, something like that. It doesn't have to be exact, just something around that size, or if you want to cut it in half, use like an eight by eight inch pan. The first thing, I've sprayed it with nonstick spray. One can, juice and all, of, I'm using peaches. Now this is where you can use your likes. Whatever kind of fruit that you like, one part of it needs to be something in juice because you're gonna see why in a minute. So I'm using just peach chunks. I happen to love the combination of peaches and blueberries. And I've got some fresh blueberries. Oh, I don't know, a couple of cups or so of blueberries. And I really, really, that one's got a stem on it. Let's get that off there. I really like coconut. So I'm gonna add about half a cup of just plain flaked coconut. And you wanna stir that together just to kind of get the fruit spread out. And make sure that you got a little bit of everything everywhere so that when you take a bite at the end, you're getting all those flavors. You could use strawberries, raspberries, pineapple, whatever you like. Just make sure that you have enough fruit all together that fits the bottom of the pan and make sure that one of them is the kind of fruit, like canned fruit, that has the syrup. You can use either heavy syrup or in light syrup, but you need, don't drain it, because you need that to make the, the, the cake part of this. Then take one box of whatever kind of cake mix that you like. I'm just using white. This is just a white cake mix. Straight out of the box. Sprinkle it evenly over top of the fruit. Don't mix it, just pour it over there. I know you're going, that can't possibly work, but it does and it is delicious and so simple to make. Just lightly kind of spread that out. Just take your fingers and get rid of any big clumps. Then you're going to mix about half a cup of light, I'm using light brown sugar, you could use dark brown, whatever kind you have on hand. I chose almonds, but you could just as easily use walnuts or pecans or whatever kind of nut that you like. I just really like wal or almonds. Mix that together and add about half a teaspoon of just ground cinnamon. Set that aside for just a second. Now, I have one stick of butter that I have just cut into pieces and I'm just going to evenly lay the butter over top of the cake mix. Don't stir it in, don't melt it, just lay it on top evenly. You See how I'm doing it, just you want a little bit, it's going to melt in the oven so don't worry about it, just dot it over there in an even manner, one stick of butter. And that looks good to me. And then take your fruit or your um, crumble mixture. This is what I would put on top of 
you know, like a fruit crisp. You could add some oatmeal to this if you wanted to. Some, just some rolled oats. But I'm not going to do that today, but you, you could. And just lightly put that over top of the butter mixture all over the top of the cake. And that is it. That, now, that was simple. Anybody could do that. 350 degrees for about 40 minutes. And it will come out and be just crisp on top because that brown sugar and butter is gonna caramelize. And the fruit will be warm, the cake will be baked, and it will be wonderful. See what I was talking about? It's not a cake, it's not a crisp, it's not a crumble. It's all of those together, and we're calling it a fruit cramble, and it is really good, especially warm out of the oven with some ice cream on top or whipped cream. It's divine. So that's just, and again, you could completely mix up the fruit to whatever you like. Now, let's get on to our main dish. Now, here is where I start the night before. You know, life is busy. And I love, especially when school is in season for my boys, I love to use my crock pot because I can do so much prep ahead of time the night before. And then in the morning before I leave to take the boys to school, I can just put it in my crock pot. And oftentimes what I will do is take the liner out of my crock pot and I will, whatever I'm fixing, for that meal, get it in the crock pot, put the, put the lid on it, and put this whole thing in the refrigerator. And then the next morning, all I have to do is take this out, pop it into the base on low, and let it go all day long. This particular recipe does need to be cooked on low. Now, I really like just roast, like a roast beef type meal. This is not one of those times when you want to use you know, like a tenderloin roast or anything like that. It, it's expensive for one, and to me it has no flavor. For me, I would much rather have a chuck roast, and that's what this is. This is just a plain chuck, beef chuck roast that you buy in the grocery stores. It is a tougher cut of meat. It's a lot less expensive, but when you cook it low and slow in your crock pot, it's mouth-wateringly good. Let me show you a couple things you want to look for in a chuck roast. You see how this one has some even marbling in the, the meat itself? You see those little veins of the fat in there? You want to have that because that's going to melt over the long process of cooking and add flavor. I don't like to buy ro chuck roasts that have those huge pockets of fat in them. So I always look through the roasts that the butcher has put out in the, in the, the meat case and find one that doesn't, you know, this like this one right here is okay and that little piece right there. But some of them have those big chunks of fat in them that are like this size. I don't buy those. I get the ones that are a little less fatty. And I always let my meat come up to temperature for like 30 minutes on the counter before I start cooking the, the, the beef or chicken or whatever it is that I'm cooking. I'm gonna take a quick break and when I come back, I'm gonna show you how to prepare this to go in the crock pot. I'll be back in just a minute. And welcome back. Now our fruit cramble is in the oven and we're going to work on our roast. I do this the night before, but even if you're not going to refrigerate it overnight in the crock pot, anytime that I am cooking a piece of beef or even like a pork roast or even chicken, oftentimes I will do this, but especially with beef and pork, I will take salt, kosher salt, and sprinkle it on the roast. And then I add a little bit of cracked black pepper, freshly ground black pepper. And I will wrap that up in saran wrap or put it in a bowl and cover it somehow. 
and put that in the refrigerator overnight. Reason being, the salt will penetrate into the meat and flavor and season the meat completely and thoroughly, and then it just comes back out to the surface, and you can pat with a paper towel if you're going to be searing or something. But for our purposes today, we don't need to do that. But any time that you're cooking a big piece of beef or pork, like a pork loin or something like that, salt it the night before and let it set for like overnight, or if you're doing it uh, you know, during the day, you want to let it set for a couple of hours. And then I just put it straight after that night, you know, the overnight soak. Now, if I was going to do my crock pot like I am today, I would just put it in my crock pot, put my seasonings on it, put it in the fridge. Then I like just one package of the dried onion soup mix. You know what I'm talking about out of the grocery store. Sprinkle that on there. And then a little bit of beef broth, just canned beef broth. I need to find my opener here. Here, here we go. I don't, add, now at this point, I would put this in the refrigerator overnight. The next morning, I would take my beef broth, just one little can, and just pour it over it. That's it. Put the lid on it, turn it to low, let it go all day long, and when you come home from work or school or whatever you're doing, you will have dinner almost completely done. So we just need to put this on low. Now my settings are warm, low, and high. I'm going to put it on low. I'm just going to plug it in and let it go. I love crock pots, especially when I'm busy. Now my particular model locks and I like that. And I just let it go. Leave it on my counter and go about my day. And when I come back home of an evening, then my roast is done. Now, to go alongside your roast, you got to have potatoes. I mean, you just got to have mashed potatoes with a beef roast. So I have in this pan just some plain uh, potatoes that I have peeled and cubed up, because that's how my mom uh, did her potatoes. Some people slice them, some people, you know, d d just cut them in half, different ways. Cut out any spots like that that you see in your potato. I have a garbage pail over here. But my mom always did this, so that's what I do. <laughs> she cut them and then cut them into chunks like that. But you can also just slice them any way that you want. I have about five pounds because I'm feeding a lot of people. Uh, you know, you think about, these are kind of small potatoes, so I probably would think two potatoes per person. If they're real big, one potato per person. You can, if you want, to leave the skins on. Sometimes I'll leave the skins on my mashed potatoes, but I'm not going to do that today. I'm, I'm going to peel them. I personally grew up using a paring knife not a peeler, but if you like to use a peeler, you can. I find, oddly enough, that with potatoes, it's awkward for me. Always start your potatoes in cold water. Never put them down into boiling water for mashed potatoes because it just causes this fuzzy type uh, outside surface on your potato, and it's, it's not very good. So just make sure they're submerged in cold water and bring them up to a simmer and then we're going to take that lid off and then is when we will season our potatoes. You've heard me say so often I never add salt to a cold pot because the salt won't dissolve and it'll settle down into the bottom of your pot and it can really damage your pot. So I never add my salt until my water has come up to a simmer. I'm going to take a quick break. I'm just going to clean up my mess. When I come back we are going to make a wonderful little side salad to go with our dinner. I'll be back in just a minute.
and welcome back. Now our beef is done, our potatoes are cooking, and our wonderful dessert is in the oven. But let's make a little easy salad to go alongside it. You know, that's pretty rich dish, the, the beef and all of that. The potatoes can be kind of heavy. So you need something light and refreshing. And this is one of those salads that's wonderful in the summer when the tomatoes are good. And it's an Italian salad called a caprese salad. If you've never had it, couldn't be simpler. We've got some tomatoes, just red, ripe, juicy tomatoes. And you want to slice them as thin or as thick as you like. And just lay them out on a plate, just like that. I've taken the core out kind of thick slices. You can use little Roma tomatoes if you want to. You could even use the little cherry tomatoes and cut them in half, which would be very good. And I'm just laying them out on a plate in a pretty little manner. One more here. I've got three tomatoes. This could be the side salad to your dinner, or it could be a, a you know, a starter for everybody to like an appetizer type thing, however you want to eat it. Now, I've got my tomatoes. Let me wipe up my tomato juice here. I'm going to salt and lightly pepper the tomatoes. You really do need good summer tomatoes for this dish. Don't even bother with those winter tomatoes that have no flavor. You need the good tomatoes for this salad. And tomatoes need some salt. Then I have one package of fresh mozzarella cheese. This can be found in any grocery store in the dairy department. Fresh mozzarella is absolutely delicious. One of my favorite, favorite flavors. Let me wipe off my knife. You need a serrated knife for this, and you want to cut it into just small rounds. This is a wonderful topping for homemade pizzas, if you ever make your own pizzas. And I do that at home quite often. My boys love them. My favorite pizza, actually, is called a pizza margarita. And it was made for a queen, Queen Margarita, in Italy. And it uses little round Roma tomato slices, fresh mozzarella, and fresh basil. So this is one of those things that's just one of my favorite flavor combinations. You want to take your slices of your mozzarella and kind of tuck in there in between your tomatoes to make it look so pretty on a platter of some sort. Just in between your slices and then any extras you can just lay over like this. It's just so pretty on your plate. Let's make this one here to where you've got that fresh. Oh, so good. Mm -mm -mm. Now, another ingredient that you need for this salad is fresh basil. Now, I, this is how I keep my herbs in my refrigerator. I grow basil at home on my, in my herb garden but you can buy it in the stores. It's very easy to grow. Just get your little, uh, the little plants in the spring, and I plant them in flower pots. This was picked this morning from my little herb garden. If you have never had fresh basil, let me tell you, you need to grow it. And I wanted, I wanted to show you something. Purposefully, I did not take this off. Let me see if I can get a good angle on it. You see the end of this basil, how it has that little part at home, when your plants start doing that, pinch that off, and I sprinkle it down in my dirt, and it can reseed itself, because that will take away from the plant, the growth of the plants. So I always pinch those off. 
and I just, I've got big leaves and little leaves. Fresh basil has its own unique flavor, a little anisey in its flavor, a little licorice -y, but it's absolutely delicious. Mm, so, so, so good. Then you want to take your, you can either take the whole leaves or you can stack them up just like this, the bigger leaves. Stack them up one on top of the other. Just, I washed it this morning before I wrap it in damp paper towels and it'll stay in your refrigerator that way. And then just kind of roll it up tightly. Take a little paring knife or your chef's knife and slice little thin ribbons. Don't do this till right before you start to serve it because it, it, it will turn black on you. Then you want good olive oil, drizzle over it. A little bit of olive oil. You could add some lemon juice if you wanted to. You could drizzle some balsamic vinegar over it. And then take your, if you don't want to cut the basil like this, you can tear it. If they're little leaves, leave them whole. And then just sprinkle it over top of your salad. And that is called a caprese salad. And it is wonderful in the summer with fresh, good garden tomatoes. The mozzarella is available all year long. Basil is available all year long. Grow your own. I, you know, I just have it on my back porch in my flower pots, my window box type things over my railing of my deck. I have herbs instead of, well, I have sunflowers, but mostly herbs. And that's it. That's all there is to it. If you want to add a final little bit of pepper, you can. Wonderful. You need bread to go along with your meal. I just have a couple of loaves of French bread, and I'm going to drizzle it. You could do butter or olive oil. Olive oil is very heart healthy. And I'm not talking about the $50 a bottle olive oil. I'm talking about the stuff that you get in the grocery stores. I buy just, I still get the extra virgin, but I buy the store brand, and it's very good, and it's not expensive, and it's very healthy. And then just shredded Parmesan cheese over top. Put this in the oven for like five minutes, and there you go. You're done. Warm it up. You don't even have to add the cheese, but I just happen to like it. But any kind of loaf bread, if you have a bread maker, a fresh loaf of bread, we're going to be doing some of that on another show. I love my bread maker at home. And that's all there is to that. You can add a little cracked pepper over top of that cheese if you want to. You don't need any salt because Parmesan cheese is salty. And put that under the broiler for like two minutes, and there you go. That's it for your bread. Now, our potatoes are tender. I have drained them. And I'm going to add some salt because potatoes need salt. About, I don't know, teaspoon and a half, two teaspoons, something like that. Now, here is a little bit different of an ingredient that you might not have ever thought to put in your mashed potatoes. And that is cream cheese. This one is the chive and onion flavored green cream cheese. It's wonderful in mashed potatoes. And I'm just going to add the whole carton. Adds creaminess and richness, mm, and it is wonderful. I am going to add a little butter, probably about half a stick of butter. And I like to mash my potatoes with evaporated milk. I'm taking one can. I'm only going to add about half to start with. And then I like to just use my little hand mixer because that's what my mama always used. Some people use the, the, the masher, and if that's what you like, then fine. You can use that. You can use your stand mixer. But my mother always used this, and, you know, we tend to grow up doing the things that our mama did. I added about half that can of evaporated milk, but I can tell you right now, I'm going to add more. And it really just depends on the consistency of your potato, but all, start out with less than what you think you're going to need, because you can always add more and you can't take it away. And I like my potatoes to have a little bit of texture to them, so I do like a little bit of, of chunks in my potatoes. And that's it. That's all you need. Some pepper.
And there's your wonderful bowl of mashed potatoes. I bet many of you have never thought about putting cream cheese in your mashed potatoes. So good. Now, our potatoes are done. Let's put them in a bowl. Mmm. Yum, yum, yum. Both of my boys adore mashed potatoes. They're big, big, big mashed potatoes people. So there's our wonderful mashed potatoes. Now our roast is done. Right here it is. We pick it out of the crock pot. Look at it. It's just literally fork tender, let me show you. You can literally just take your fork. Look at that. That's what happens when you cook it low and slow in your crock pot. And I just take the juice that's in the pot and put it over top. Here is our wonderful fruit crumble, our delicious blueberry and peach, and our caprese salad. Let's get our bread out of the oven. It's just going to be warm and add to our meal. Thank you for joining with me, and I will see you next time on Everyday Man. Thank you for watching Everyday Mana with Lisa. This program is made possible by viewers like you. Your support is continually needed to keep Christian programming on the air. Please send your best financial gift to Living Faith Television in care of Everyday Mana, 